Good evening, and welcome to CB8 Speaks. Community Board 8 in Manhattan comprises the Upper East Side from East 59th Street to East 96th Street, from 5th Avenue to the East River, and includes Roosevelt Island. The Community Board is an advisory body of the City Government of New York, and this show is to help everyone understand in the Community District 8 what the Community Board is all about. Tonight's guest is Michelle Birnbaum. Michelle is the chairperson of the Vendor Task Force Committee of Community Board 8. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much for having me, Monica. Michelle, could you tell us how did you get involved with the Community Board? Sure. Actually, um, quite a few years ago, probably around 2005, um, I was interested in many community issues. I was interested in some preservation issues, and I was also very interested in the vendor issue. And I started to attend the committee meetings of the community board relevant to those topics, the Landmarks Committee, the full board, and the Street Life Committee, which at that time could handle some vendor issues. And I actually brought the issues to that committee and um, with particularly with the vendor, com the street life of the vendor uh, situation, and actually we got a pretty good resolution on what could be done about some of the vendor issues at that time. And so from my participation, I then thought, well, gee, I'd like to have a vote as long as I'm attending the meetings, and I found my way through the application process and was fortunate enough to have been appointed. Important to know because a lot of people who watch the show may not know that it's just investigating to get involved with the community mm -hmm. board and you took it upon yourself to look into it. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking before the show about the need for people to get involved. How did you um, uh, get involved with the, the, the task force? It was very clear from the communications that the community board district office was getting and from just our general observations around the, the neighborhood that the issue of vendors was, um, was prominent in people's minds. We were getting a lot of feedback at the community board office about, about complaints, um, concerns, proliferation, uh, imposition on the quality of life. And, um, and so we thought it would be a good idea, since this has always been an interest of of mine, uh, and I spoke with Nick uh, Viest, our chair, who also sits on our committee, um, as to whether or not we could sort of resurrect that task force committee. And so it was really an outgrowth of the input that the community was giving us. So I'm very happy to say that that started about a year and a half ago in a formal way. And over the past years, we've been meeting uh, regularly and consistently to discuss these issues. What have you been exactly discussing the last well, year? Well, actually, what has happened is it, the vendor situation is a very, very complex situation because it's governed by both city and state law, and also there are many different kinds of vendors. There are free speech vendors, and there are veteran vendors, there are disabled veteran vendors, general merchandise vendors, food truck vendors, food cart vendors, fruit stand vendors, many, many different kinds. Each of these is regulated by a different agency, it could be Board of Health, could be the Department of Consumer Affairs, and they also have loads of different laws on the books. And so before we could actually tackle um, sort of what we, uh, solutions to what we saw as concerns, we had to really understand what it was that we were dealing with. And so what we did in a very systematic way at each of our meetings is we examined each of those vendor categories. We learned about what the law stated, who was affected by it, and one of our main um, uh, concerns is we wanted to involve everybody in the community including the vendor community, because in order to ultimately get solutions, you really needed the impact of everybody. And uh, while we have had complaints about the quality of life that vendor presence has caused, vendors are professionals who work very, very hard. Uh, many of them put in very long hours, and uh, we, wanted, we wanted their input. But we also, we respect them as professionals and as workers, but we want them also to be regulated and controlled and monitored as professionals. In other words, so that as in any professional job or organization, there's, you've got to play by the rules, you've got to follow the law, you have to be compliant, and you have to be neighborhood friendly. Going back to the start of what you were saying, you mentioned free speech vendors sure. and veterans. 
Can you explain that to the audience? Because I don't think people really know what well, that is. Well, free speech vendors don't need licensing. All other vendors need licensing. And the licensing is, a, is sort of a complicated issue, but it suffice it to say for this conversation, everybody has to be licensed. If you have a cart, that cart has to have a separate permit. So the person is licensed, the vehicle is permitted. In the case of a free speech vendor, um, which used to be mainly print media, times have actually changed. Uh, free speech vendors now can include those who sell baseball cards. Uh, it used to be also people who sold art, and at one time it meant their art, but now it no longer means necessarily their art. It could be anybody's art. And so, it's it, you know, things get broadened out over the years. However, a free speech vendor, by, because he's protected by the Constitution, is it does not need a license to make his point on the street. However, it doesn't mean he doesn't need to be compliant. I mean, he still should have the eight-foot table and some of the other things that any, you know, another vendor should have, but he has the right to be on, you know, in a place on a street. And the veterans, um, what's so special about them? Well, because uh, communities and governments wanted to give veterans an opportunity to have work when they, you know, come out and after they have served in, in an effort to show their appreciation of their service. Uh, veterans, of course, are welcome to do anything in any part of the private or public sector, but this was just one way to give them an opportunity. And so they have um, they have access to streets that others may not have access to. And as a matter of fact, one of the things we talked about in our committee is we would love to have some kind of an identification on either a food vehicle or cart or a general merchandise table to indicate that it is a vendor that's selling, uh, it, that it is a veteran that's selling because I'm sure the public would like very, very much to give that person their business. You mentioned also eight-foot table, which gets into the issue of what are the regulations, compliance, the yeah. compliance in street furniture. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about I that? I can. The compliance is, um, there are lots of regulations. Some of the ones that the public would immediately recognize would be uh, they should have an eight-foot table and a chair. Um, they can't be near a hydrant. A new law has just come up. They can't be less than 20 feet from either a main entrance or a service entrance of a building. Mm -hmm. A new legislation also just restricted them in front of hospitals and nursing homes, etc. So, they, uh, so they, there, there are, and there are a list of restricted streets. Uh, there is government list of restricted streets in each borough, and vendors are not permitted to be on that street. But mm -hmm. there are some exceptions to that as well, some free speech vendors, etc. So it's pretty complicated. Yeah. But there is a set of guidelines and rules that they do have to go by. What about when you see a street with, like, back-to-back -back vendors? Mm -hmm. Are some streets, uh, there is no limit to them, or what, what's going on with that? Well, that's that? actually one of the things that we concluded in some of our solutions, uh, which I know this is going to be a two-part program, and so we're going to explore that a little more uh, the next uh, in, during the next program when we go to solutions. But um, yes, at the moment, there are no restrictions on the amount of vendors per block, as long as that block permits vendors. But it is something that we are looking into, and it is, it is something that we'd like to change. Change. I've been to quite a few of the meetings, and the vendors who have shown up, many of them have said they do want some kind of control yes. because it's crazy chaos on some streets. Yes. Um, and also what happens is that promotes a vendor from trying to try to stay on the street for a 24-hour period so as not to lose his spot. So very often you'll see a fruit vendor or a general merchandise vendor set up the table and then you wonder how they're staying there day and night. They have somebody else man the, um, the area, but they feel if they pull their card or table away mm -hmm. that their spot's going to be taken by somebody else. So if we could somehow regulate this, control it, it would benefit both the neighborhood and the vendor community as well. You have some photos that you've shared. We're going to be showing mm -hmm. the background of... Good. of you know, a vendor doesn't just leave, go get his merchandise, and then come back. No. Right. It's, it's more complicated than that. And also, one of the things we're really facing, which we discussed at length, 
was something called inventory trucks. So I'll give you an example. Probably everybody in the audience has seen a fruit vendor mm -hmm. somewhere in their neighborhood on a corner or mid-block. And you might notice that next to many park, next to many of these fruit vendors, are big inventory trucks, big box trucks, in which are all the fruits and vegetables. Now, that kind of supply permits the vendor to be on the street for many more hours a day than he would ordinarily be if he had to only sell the merchandise <clears throat> that he arrived with in the morning. And of course, that opens up all kinds of health concerns about temperature, the stuff that's in the inventory truck or even on the street. Is it very hot? Is it very cold? How is it cleaned? How is it washed? How is the cart washed and attended to? And um, I don't know if it's for this, uh, this program or the next, but there's something called commissaries, which, which are um, organizations that are actually not run by the government, but run by private, you know, privately owned centers that a vendor is supposed to bring his car to at the end of each day. Uh, it's either stored there, it's cleaned there, garbage is supposed to be accounted for when it comes in and out, uh, that it's cleaned with potable water, that a, a truck has potable water, and all kinds of regulations, that the commissary is supposed to ensure that the vendor is on the street uh, adhering to those regulations. Once you find that some vendors are on the street an excessive amount of time or too many hours making it impossible to comply, you run into other issues. And so ultimately, as one of our solutions, one of the things we wanted to see is that whether even if it's a general merchandise vendor, that whoever, whatever merchandise you are selling, when you show up with it that day, uh, when, it's, when it's done and the merchandise is sold, then that's when you would leave for the day. Because general merchandise vendors also have vans that might stand very next to their, you know, very close to their uh, tables. Now, one of the other issues with that is a good percentage of the time they are taking metered parking spots. And number one, it's illegal to vend from the truck or van at the meter spot. But even if they're not doing that, it's not legal to stay at one meter all day long and feed that meter. Uh, it's a very difficult thing for the police to enforce, however, but that is the law. Also, it takes the metered spots away from the customers of the surrounding businesses, the restaurants, the food stores, any of the shopping businesses. And those meters are put in those commercial districts specifically to help those businesses so that, you know, their customers, they can service their customers. You have so much information, but you've actually conducted some research. Could you explain the research that's been done? Well, one of the things that we did during the course of the year as we were studying each vendor group, and we decided we wanted to see exactly how many vendors were in our community. Now, mind you, of course, that varies and varies very significantly with the time of the year, the weather, whether or not there's a holiday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the map you see behind us is actually, we were very, very fortunate, but we had the service of a graduate school uh, an intern who was in the graduate school at Hunter College. And uh, he came to us and offered his service, and um, we were able to ask of him something that we really couldn't do without any additional manpower. And that was basically to walk the district. And as you had mentioned, our district um, is from 59th up to 96th Street, and uh, from the park on one side to Central Park on the other. We did not we did not include Roosevelt Island because it's not so much of an issue on Roosevelt mm -hmm. Island. And what he did and um, this is actually, this is an accounting, but you must be mindful that it's an accounting mm -hmm. of the, one of the coldest days of the year. This was done in December and January, specifically to coincide with an intern's uh, school holiday. So it wasn't necessarily the best time to get a vendor count, mm -hmm. but we do have a great basis. It's a beautiful map. He color-coded the different mm -hmm. kinds of vendors yeah. and their locations. Um, and we can only assume, and we know, that as the weather gets warmer, better, um, this number multiplies significantly. Mm -hmm. And in addition to like holidays, like you might even remember this past New Year's and Christmas, you had all the people selling, you know, 2014 merchandise on the streets. So it increases with some kind of festivity, St. Patrick's Day or anything like that. You mm -hmm. have an increased number of vendors. Mm -hmm. But it was very mm -hmm. helpful to have this and to actually do a, vi just look at it visually. Mm -hmm. 
and see what it is that um, that we have to contend with. Yeah, I was actually noticing the cooking food, which mm -hmm. is the red, and look how many right. red there are here. Yeah, and that's an extremely big issue in this community. Mm -hmm. um, cooking food um, presents a tremendous challenge. For example, if you took your barbecue out in front of your house and wanted to cook something, you would not, that's illegal for you to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Now, food truck vendors are proliferating, and people complain because of the, even though it might smell good <laughs> and it might seem tasty, the cooking odors are permeating. Um, they're going into people's homes and offices, mm -hmm. and so people feel that they are always in the presence and sort of a captive audience for cooking vendors, mm -hmm. for truck vendors particularly, and also the cooking ones that are on the street. That's very significant because they're closer to the building line. Yeah. Also, it's a matter of where they put their refuse and their oil. Mm -hmm. Also, it's a matter of idling. It breaks an idle, uh, idling law. Also, they're parked at a meter in one place. They're supposed to be circulating. Now, we understand it's not in their best business interest to be driving around because, in fact, they do develop, in quotes, a clientele where they are. And, in fact, one vendor actually uh, handed out menus that he delivers. So he necessarily had to be in one place at one time. Well, those are all the activities of a bricks-and-mortar business, and that's one of the big issues with the vendor community is we want to live with them and have the right amount of numbers and in the right place, but not breach our bricks-and-mortar businesses, which are really struggling. If you have mm -hmm. a fruit stand, a vendor fruit stand, no matter how much you may like the vendor or like the fruit, if he's outside of a, of a market, an, a bricks-and-mortar business that's selling fruit, it very significantly impacts that bricks-and-mortar business. And don't forget, they have premises, they have rent, they have insurance, they have all kinds of compliance regulations that um, vent street vendors do not have. And one of our solutions is to actually move towards that to make it so that, you, you know, uh, vendors would have to be more in keeping with the restaurants and supermarkets. For example, the supermarket, if you have produce uh, in refrigeration, that produce has to be a certain temperature. That's not necessarily true with the stand on the street. Uh, you have some pictures of actually selling something that is it's not appropriate to sell, and mm -hmm. that is cutting fruit. You're not allowed to stand and cut fruit on the street mm -hmm. and make your own personal packets of it. You're not allowed to bag your own cookies that you've baked or your own candy and put it in your self-wrapped plastic bag, and yet you see that all over the city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are very significant issues from a health point of view, from a business point of view, but we really want the vendors to join with us. And they have attended our meetings, um, and they have voice their opinion and uh, and uh, you know some are trying to be more compliant than others and more mindful of the community than others but we certainly always look forward to working with them because inevitably the control here is with legislation and everybody has to support that in order for it to happen mm -hmm. now you've, you've talked about some of the issues of can you recall some of the key complaints that have been coming into these meetings from the businesses and yes. the individuals yes I can yeah the food and the odors and the grease and the litter is an enormous one. Mm -hmm. The board office gets complaints about that all the time. People have come to our meetings to say that they're getting tickets for the litter that's in front of their building that was actually created by vendors. We have one street in our community um, that has many, many vendors lined up in a row, and the side of that, and that, a private, a building, um, faces that vendor row. And that building has been fined many, many times for the litter in the street because what people don't know, and the litter on the sidewalk, is that a building, an establishment, a business is responsible for the litter in front of his or her business into the gutter, about 12 to 14 inches. So that is a tremendous responsibility for a bricks and mortar entity of any kind to have when there are others conducting business on what's supposed to be the area that he's responsible for. Mm -hmm. This is a major issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, the commissaries are supposed to play a role in this and that a vendor is supposed to bring their garbage back to the commissary at the end of the day. But in fact, 
there's no real accounting of this or signing in and out of, of this. It's, it's, um, it's a little bit of a freewheeling system that one of our solutions is we'd like to see it more regulated. Could you also explain to the audience um, one issue that uh, is often I've heard asked at these meetings are the, the person standing at the cart, people assume that's the vendor. But it may yeah, not be. It may not be. The cart might be owned by somebody else. The vendor who's servicing it may be licensed, must be licensed. He may not always be, but that's noncompliance. But he's supposed to be licensed. And he may be licensed, but he may not own the cart. So that being the case, you can have many vendors, licensed vendors, rotating through a day to man a cart. And you can also have permit holders or, or people owning many carts and then hiring vendors to service their carts. So it ends up being a multiple layer of a business, not just one man, one cart. And it's actually very big business. It's not small business. It's very, very big business. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things we took photos of, for example, the fruit distributors, they all have the, the distribution business on the sides of their trucks. And there are many, many distributors that distribute fruit. And the trucks are very large. They fill it up with inventory. And you know that they may be servicing one or many carts. Some of the other things that I've heard at some of the meetings are the question of, you mentioned refrigeration before, refrigeration or health code violations. I mean, what, it, it's, it seems like there are a lot of gaps. Well, the Department of Health, when, if you're a food vendor, you are required to take a course at the Department of Health. And when you're servicing and you're handling the food, you need to wear gloves, you need to have, uh, you know, your hair protected. So there, there are regulations, and now there's a move to also give them the alphabet ratings that you see on restaurants, A, B, C, et cetera, which I think is a very helpful thing to do. Actually, in the news today, there was talk about a, a hot dog vendor uh, way downtown who has multiple sanitary violations that he has not paid those tickets and in fact he's still in business. So this is a big issue. The Board of Health is responsible for that. The Department of Health is responsible for that. And in fact many times uh, uh, depending on consumer complaints and my own observations I have called uh, people from the Department of Health, and they have made rounds in the areas that we've talked about, and they have been attending our meetings. Mm -hmm. So we get good input. We have the Department of Consumer Affairs, who's in charge of the general merchandise vendors, the handbags and sweaters and stuff like that that you see around, and uh, they've attended our meetings. Uh, elected officials come, because it's a joint effort of, uh, among multiple agencies to try to have this under control. And it's increasingly in the interest of everybody, in including the vendor community. Now, there had been um, a, a, a task force committee meeting, uh, which included representatives of other community boards and business improvement districts. Um, can you kind of, were there similarities, differences that you? Yeah, there was a lot of legislation introduced. Uh, we. Uh, in our district. We've had very good help from Council Member Dan Gorodnik and also a Council Member Jessica Lappin uh, when she was in, in office. And um, so I had the opportunity, I would go down to the Council hearings and testify, and so I had the opportunity to actually listen to the testimony of people from other boroughs and their Council members. And the one thing I came away with is that this is a citywide issue. There are many, many communities, all, all the five boroughs, that have concerns about this. Now, there are communities, there are some communities that want more vendors than others. I mean, there is, there is a difference uh, with what a community might want. There's also a difference in the amount of commercial streets. Now, one of the things we're pushing for is we don't want any vending on residential streets. We feel that it's a residence. If you rent or own, you, you did it with an expectation of privacy and quiet and to be in a non-commercial area. So we feel that should be honored. We also heard about, and I think you have some pictures of, the fact that these vending businesses are expanding. Big restaurants are now saying to themselves, well, why should I sign a, a, a long lease 
spend all kinds of money opening multiple restaurants when I can expand my business using food trucks. And in fact, if you look at the names on the food trucks, you'll see that many of them have started with bricks and mortar, but now they are truck businesses. We have um, a very enterprising young lady who opened a dress and jewelry business in a truck. <laughs> Uh, we have another enterprising person who opened uh, um, vintage clothing in a truck. We have spotted a notary who now sits in his car at a certain corner, and he notarizes. So the issue is this. Do you want this kind of business springing up all over the city mm -hmm. with all that uh, that entails? We had a DNA testing truck circulate through the city. We have a facial imaging truck. Uh, we, I just spotted a new one, a popcorn truck, in a hospital zone, in a no-standing zone. So this is wide, widespread. We think that the mayor's office should be involved. We think that the small business uh, people should be involved in this. And a lot of this stuff is really under the radar with government because it's on the street and they only people only know as much as is reported. We're trying to get a handle on all of it. Having said that, the reason... Uh, at this last meeting, it was from those observations how this is really citywide that I thought, you know what, after all our research for this past year and a half, we really want to involve everybody else. We want to get the bids involved, those are business improvement districts, people from all over the boroughs, um, community organizations, block associations, residents, businesses, whoever would like to be involved. And there was just one item on that agenda, our past meeting, and it was asking all these people about their thoughts and feelings. A lot of it was the same. People had the same concerns. Some of it, depending on where they live, they might care more about one issue than another. That's okay. There's enough common ground where if we can tackle it together, it would be very helpful. And as a matter of fact, with an eye towards that and as an outgrowth of that meeting, we are actually on May 20th um, going to have a forum where we're hoping to reach out to everybody in all of the boroughs see if we can find some common ground and actually have them sort of organize within themselves because we're all speaking with one voice, but we sort of don't know about each other. And hopefully the vendors will participate. We want them, so we hope, we hope they do. That's great. For people to find out about this May 20th meeting, they can visit the website, cbm.com. Yeah, because yep. it will be on the calendar. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you a heads up about the date mm -hmm. because uh, it may or may not be on this minute. Mm -hmm. But if you go click on to the, the month of the calendar mm -hmm. for that specific month, you'll get all of the readings of all of the committees because they're, you, you know the public might have interest in any of those committees. We're pretty broad-based. We cover a lot of ground in our committees. Well, with that, um, thank you for being here, Michelle. Thank we, you. This is the first of two shows because this is such a gigantic topic. Thanks, everyone, for watching tonight. And again, uh, for those of you who live in Community District 8, which is the Upper East Side in Roosevelt Island, please visit the website, cbm.com. Get involved. Come to the meetings that are listed on the calendar. And thank you for watching tonight.